Welcome to the Fane of Fantasy. This channel is all about giving you inspiration to master your craft and create fantasy that will truly immerse your audience. I'm kind of getting into a really good uh, role at the moment here with uh, one interview after the other. So there's a lot of good people talking to me these days about world building, which uh, I like very much. So I, I don't mind a bit. So th today um, I'm actually having a visitor from across the Atlantic. So, Rudy, maybe you will say a few words about yourself? Well, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Roderick MacDonald, though I go by Roddy. Um, I was born and raised in Scotland. I moved to America uh, as a 30-year-old um, to pursue my career in nursing because that was my day job before I decided, well, it still will be my day job, before I decided to get into writing. So uh, that's, I would say that's my very brief potted history. Scottish, now living in America, very happy with it. Worked as a nurse, now writing. Oh, and once upon a time, I studied philosophy and English literature, but don't hold that against me. <laughs> that's not your fault. <laughs> no, it, 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 my burger flipping degree. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we had a bit of a chat uh, and um, we came up that we came up with, with a, quite an interesting topic here for today because, uh, and. Well, I've not had anybody talking about this before on the channel, so this is going to be a first. Uh, but that, that's good for you, Roddy, because no matter what you say, there'll be nobody contradicting uh, you. So, uh, so that's a good start. So um, we're going to talk about morality in the world. So right. where do we start with all of this, Roddy? Well, I think um, that you know one of the things you've got to worry about, or not worry about, when you're creating a world, you have to have a, a basis for why people behave the way they do and uh, you know their belief systems and how it affects their actions. So um, which basically comes down to morality. I mean you know you've got to what people think are, are good actions, what they think are detrimental actions, and where they derive uh, that uh, sense of right and wrong from. I mean, in fantasy, you've got a great uh, opportunity to go in lots and lots of different directions to morality. You don't have to have uh, a good versus evil. You could have uh, people driven by morality based on uh, duty versus rebellion, uh, ver of, or a morality uh, strongly familial based around sort of, you know, the family versus outsiders. So when you're creating a world, obviously the first things you're going to do are your big picture stuff, your, your cosmology, your histories, your levels of technology. Um, but uh, at some point or another, you're going to have to address um, the whys and wherefores of what your uh, characters are, are doing and the uh, underlying structures of why they do that. So, you you know, it's, it's you know, if, if you look at it in, in more sim in simplistic terms, you're going to be thinking, well, you know, there, there's going to be characters who have, uh, you know, I shall, you know, very, uh, you know, I will never kill. Um, it's, you know, or I will, um, you know, or lesser strictures. I'm never going to eat meat. Um, and why do they have these beliefs? Why do they have these these uh, these guidelines? And I think that um, a lot of the time in fantasy novels, it, it it isn't obviously there. There's often a religion or religions. There's often gods, um, but uh, there's less interaction between. Uh, mythology and history and the behavior of your characters and i think that you can have very fruitful um uh drivers for character behavior interaction and conflict if you have uh, a sense of the morality in that world um so um you know i, I would the way and, and the main thing the first thing I'd, I'd say is is you have to integrate the morality into the world so what uh what has been the received wisdom where does the morality come from um i think first and foremost you're going to think the the obvious answer is gods uh and religion and religious myth so you you, you know just as in our world you have many uh, uh mythologies stories parables fables which are uh, examples of moral behavior um, you know, in uh, you know our history, we've got the uh, Greek myths. You've got uh, the Vedas of India, uh, and then the Upanishads, which lead off that, which are much more sort of philosophical, actual teaching. Um, you've got you know the myths of all sort of 
basic sort of tribal peoples. You know, you can look at um, you know, Scandinavian myth, Mayan myth. You've got uh, native peoples myth in uh, North America. And all of those things tend always, uh, you know, were part of the binding structures of society. The, their common stories tied them together. But they didn't just tie the people together and identify them. They also said, like, uh, told those people what was the right way to behave, what was socially acceptable, what was taboo, um, and how to gain uh, acceptance uh, and to be a useful, functional member of their society. So, and these are the things which we take for granted because we're surrounded by this all the time. You know, it, you know I think a good way of, of putting it is that none of us today think of ourselves as living uh, according to Victorian moral standards. <laughs> you know, none of us think of ourselves as Victorian. Um, the Victorians didn't think of themselves as Victorian, but uh, you know they there was a definite, rigid social, uh, moral structure at the time. You know it was very straight laced, very buttoned down, um, based yeah, around yeah. very patriarchal, very church oriented. This is what you're going to do, and very much about um, presenting a respectable face to society. Um, amongst a certain class, and again, that's another thing when you when you're thinking about morality in in your um, fantasy world is will the morality uh, is it equal um, you know if you have a, a, a higher uh, if you have a caste ridden or caste ridden society then you'll often find that um, what's good for the goose is, is, is uh, not good for the gander or vice versa you have the situation where the people on top will pay lip service to the norms but often do the other thing do uh, you know behave very differently behind closed doors um and that is something that if you have a lead character who comes into conflict with the hypocrisy of people he believed were morally upstanding that would be a very big conflict or driver for that person um to uh, move them forward but as i was saying about victorian versus now we don't think of ourselves you know we're, we're not victorian but as you're living within your moral uh, sort of era, you don't necessarily know or identify the, the morality of your era. And I think that in fantasy writing, that's the, that's the thing that writers fall into, is they just write the story and the morality comes through as kind of incidental. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, and, and it tends to most of the time reflect a sort of, you know, the, the rather sort of uh, base assumptions of their own society and their own culture wherever it is around the world at this time. So you'll get guys like me, you know, white Western European guys, what Northern Europe. Um, and so we're gonna grow up with a sort of, you know, sort of stereotypically white Western um, outlook um, and being from, you know, Scotland, um, there's, you know, the influence would be, uh, you know, fading religious, increasingly secular. Um, uh, so you wear, so again, that's another thing that it's, where then does your morality come from? In, in not most societies, it's going to be from a religion. But if you move into post-religious society, which you can have in a fantasy world, then you, it becomes, well, what is then the uh, um, authority that people think about uh, morality coming from? So in, to have a quick rundown, what would the sources of authority be? Well, one, religion, gods, fables, mythology, all the things that tie this uh, society together, give you your rules for conduct. Um, two, you can have uh, scripture, now holy writings, holy books. Now scriptures, uh, I used the uh, Indian, uh, the Vedas as an example earlier. You know, those, the, the Vedas are, uh, you know, supposed to be um, anonymous. They're in a sense, they are received from uh, uh periods sort of sages after intense meditation they are not uh, by any specific individual i mean in mahabharata they say it's, it's from brahma but that's just that's a the epic that's not in the veda though it's sometimes thought it was the fifth veda but it's it's um you know it's more classic literature though the bhagavad gita is in the middle of it anyway i'm going off on a tangent <laughs> um but you know the point is you can have religious writings without a specific origin. So there can be sacred texts, sacred scrolls that have become a cornerstone of a society. And the and what is in those scrolls would be up for, to the author to decide, but they would then have this trickle down effect on what people would believe in the way they would act. And you and this is where the author gets to play. You can 
change um, moral norms. You don't have to play by the modern um, sort of moral playbook. You can say, no, I'm going to have in this society, um, the justice system is tremendously draconian and anything is, uh, you know, almost everything is, is punished by death. And but but at the same time, you could have, um, you know, uh, Great, much greater leeway for justified killings within society. If, if you know, if the society is based around um, power and dominance, then and uh, the fact that you know a, obtaining power um, is a good, um, then there's going to be a lot less uh, opprobrium attached to someone who murders his way to the top. Because if everyone's playing by that system of of uh, a sort of machiavellian murders okay uh, well machiavellian on steroids because machiavelli wasn't necessarily saying kill everyone um but um you know if if you've got a society where um it's okay to eliminate your political rivals or your dynastic rivals um and if, as long as you, and if you do it again within the rules that that society sets you will not have any blame attached to you then you've got sanctioned killing and it, obviously that's nothing that our society would be comfortable with or you'd have a society where you have um you know you can have it okay for your liege lord if you have a feudalistic top-down um, a society, uh, if you have a liege lord who can literally turn around to the head of your family and say, kill yourself, mm -hmm. and, be, and you have to follow that. Again, that's going to be, and again, there's, there are, that's a historical precedent for that. That used to happen. Roman era, um, feudal Japan, you know, you'd have a, one of the ways of getting rid of your dynastic enemies would be you defeat them in battle, um, and then it would be, well, I think I'd like you and your samurai to uh, kill yourselves, please. And it was a way of, you know, that happened to the Hojo, I think, uh, in 1590 after they lost their castle. You know, their, their, their opposing general said, I don't want you around anymore. You can go into exile. The rest of you can just, you know, I'm sorry, but there's no, I don't have any space for you. Too much of a threat. And so they, and, and you know, they all had to off themselves. So, and I, my apologies to any scholars of Japanese history right now, but that's my understanding. Um, so, but it, you know, and that's one of the things when you're looking through um, for alternate moralities, it's good to look at different cultures um, uh, from our world across time, but you don't have to be bound by them. You don't have to, uh, I, I don't think you should try to lift uh, a, a you know, historical moral, uh, moral system and then just insert it into a fantasy world. Um, a lot of the time, because we don't necessarily understand the, the, the ins and outs of the moral system. We know an awful lot about the Romans. We don't know exactly how their moral system worked. We just know that they had a very different view um, of uh, social correctness, um, mm -hmm. uh, sex, uh, you know, gender in relations, um, and uh, what was and was not acceptable. Um, uh, you know, we, we've, there's many different myths have been passed down about them, but they're not. Um, all we know really is that, well, we, we know quite a bit, but they're not. You know, they're not us. Um, and a lot of things which were entirely acceptable to them, you know, um, uh, are, you know, completely verboten to us. But, you know, we would class uh, a great deal of uh, respectable Roman males as, as pedophiles and pederasts. And for them, it's like, well, no, it's OK to have to be, um, you know, um, sexually attracted to young men and to have uh, sexual relations with them. Um, and, you know, there are there's love poetry and literature which reflects this acceptance of that as a norm and so this is one of the things in fantasy writing you've got this big option i'm not saying you've got an option to stick pedophiles in everywhere because that would be awful but you've got this you've, you've you've got the option if you want to explore something different if you want to give a different driver for your characters um uh, motivations you can say well the, the you can have a look at the um underpinnings of that society and what that society values and what that society views as taboo and those things shape your character's views on uh, correct and incorrect action so you, you can have situations where there there'd be very different attitudes towards thievery towards property um towards uh, you know uh, respect for family members you could it could either be extremely you can make it extremely rigid or you could make it uh, very laissez-faire very uh, lax where it's where there isn't necessarily much in the way of respect for any 
titular uh, head of household. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I, I was just thinking that, um, in, especially in fantasy, one of the things where, where you don't even have to justify the difference in morale so much is when you're dealing with different races, because, uh, you know, they, they will have completely different views on, on how to live. Uh, whereas if, of course, I mean, you're perfectly right in the fact that uh, Romans, for example, would live by a different morale than we do today. Um, but to some extent, you will still have to explain what's going on and why uh, when, you, when you're putting humans in the fantasy story. But if it's not humans, right. if it's elves or orcs or whatever it is that you're having, right. then it's more kind of default acceptance that, okay, they're different because they're different race. But that also allows you to, to kind of explore and play with topics <laughs> that if it was just a normal, let's say, thriller um, book or something and people were doing what York is doing, you know, it would be terrible and people will know what, right. what's going on here. But um, but you can actually play with, with certain themes and stuff in fantasy that I think or may basically no other genre can do in the same extent. So in that, we're blessed by that in, in writing fantasy. Oh, yeah, I, t I completely agree. I think that, you know, uh, when you're looking at different races, I mean, that's, again, you, you have such a great uh, – opportunity there to to have people with very different you know uh, mindsets you know like orcs with blood for the blood god um mm -hmm. and you know a, a belief that violence is good um and that uh you know or, or you know that, and that dominance should be exerted through violence but of course um that's a very simplistic view you've got you, you know i think when you start looking at other races you've got to think well how are their societies going to work we've got an idea about how the the human society would work um other races are often i think in a sense sort of caricature of aspects of humanity mm -hmm. you know, taken to a to an, uh, an extreme um but then you have then you know they have to have an, an underlying uh core belief system and i think the morality often is tied in to belief system though i think morality is often also it's you know created by society for society and to enable that society to function and are the rules that the people within that society agree to at that time and that evolves over time our morality is not the morality of our 16th century forebears who thought slavery was cool um but we're still western europeans um you know and so uh, you know orcish morality has you know if it's too simplistic, you wonder, and this is one of the things when you look at Tolkien and stuff as well, how did Orcish society actually survive? Because there, you know, if you have a situation where um, everyone, every orc in the tower kills themselves in the, to enable Sam and Frodo to escape, I mean, why didn't they wipe themselves out already? And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know it's just that they're, um, they're, it's so self-defeating at times conveniently. Um, you, you know, there has to be a, a sense of what is going to, drive them to reproduce to you know, care or not for the young you know is it so do, do they you know it, it do they come into being fully fleshed or not um you know I, I do think that our antagonist races um if you have them need to have a better reason for being other than to be the object that needs to be defeated mm -hmm. and part, yeah, part yeah. oh sorry well, yeah, and part yeah. of giving them that is giving them an actual reason for existing sorry yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly. you're working into it that 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 well no it's, it's that's right. um but i was just thinking um uh, now it's better <laughs> just as i pointed it out um but i was just thinking um because we you're kind of getting into to maybe touching on upon, on upon, upon something that that would be very relevant I think and that that's basically how so how do we design it so so when we have uh, when we want to put some differences in morality it could be different uh, nations of humans but it could also be different races it doesn't really matter but, yeah. but how how would you go about designing the morality into the world so what do we need to think about when we come up with it. And you touched upon some of it there, I think, in terms of them used to be a lot and so forth. Right. Well, I think that uh, I think that every I think that all you have to do again is look at um, every many ancient cultures. I like to look at it from the perspective of ancient. Many ancient cultures have their own origin story, um, their own where their people came from, how their people came together, a legendary leader or king or queen, um, and who. Found, founded their people and often uh, the character of that 
people is is determined in many ways by their origin story so so you look at the origin story of in your world i competing kingdoms competing civilizations um uh, or different races um and they'll that will help to inform their attitude going forward how do you do this um you know i think that uh, again as an author what you're not looking at this is you shouldn't be trying to produce a, a, a gazetteer or an encyclopedia of this world. What you're trying to do is create an environment where your characters and the story thrive and are highlighted. So you only you're looking at it as the author from the end point of well, what's my drama? What's my story? And then um, will. Uh, conflicts in terms will there be satisfying conflict if i have uh, a group of people who believe in um you know uh violent expansion in order to justify um their racial superiority and the taking of slaves versus uh, a society um which uh, you know uh, believes in the stoic tradition of um, trying to divorce themselves from emotional judgment and do what is correct with, um, uh, without emotional input, uh, even uh, you know, in all circumstances, and how would they face off against this very aggressive, potentially emotionally driven, you know, it's not like, you know, and the Stoics were a huge part of um, ancient uh, history, which are, it gets largely forgotten about. You, you think about um, the Greeks and the Romans and their society, um, and then coming a Christianity and uh, a, a whole, you know, you had the Stoics versus the Epicureans um, versus um, well, actual full on hedonism, the Pyrrhonists, skeptics, all these different belief systems or ethical systems uh, for how to live. We're all competing with each other within the traditional Roman virtues, dignity, fidelity, all of those things. Um, uh, and then they had to those all of those things came into conflict with the on the uh, arrival of Christianity um, on one side and then you have the great movement of peoples um, from the east and, and north uh, and how that also then put a great deal of pressure on society so there in that example you've got all kinds of ways in which different moralities can interact you've got you know, using the Roman Empire as an example, you've got the Roman Empire at the center, you've got within it, it different competing ethical systems. Uh, you know, a, there's a great tradition in Rome between the Stoics and Epicureans. Um, you know, Marcus Aurelius was the most famous Stoic, um, but you have, you know, uh, large famous figures all the way through history, like uh, embodying both of those. They then have Christianity coming along and challenging social norms in Rome. This whole idea of what, you marry one woman and you're faithful to her? What's that about? That's crazy. And, and you know, and the Romans thought that because the, the Christ, early Christians preached brotherhood, they, the, the Roman propaganda was that the Christians were all incestuous. You know, oh, they're all they're all brothers and sisters. That that's just you know, whilst excusing the, the their own sexual shenanigans, mm -hmm. because their their sexual shenanigans were often an, uh, uh, an, a, a, you know expression of dominance. But then you've got you know, you so you have all this. They have this in, in, influx of the strange Christ, like religious idea some from somewhere within your own sphere of influence and then you've got an entirely other um set of people with um their own belief systems their own gods their own idols none of which are are familiar to anyone within your the roman empire or your world as were um and so so you, you then have this classics of clash of cultures and you know the romans tried to deal with this by adapting and assimilate or taking in some and then using them to fight in the frontier you know at the same time you had china over on the other side of the world um was also suffering and having to deal with these waves of invaders and people trying to to um, take them on and what tended to happen there was if it was that the invaders were um if they were successful then basically absorbed chinese culture and became Chinese, culturally Chinese in many ways. Um, so the Chinese culture persisted, you know, and the, the Roman culture buckled and died, the West, you know, the Western Roman culture. So you've got examples there. So I think that when you're writing fantasy, you know, what you want, you're thinking about um, uh, how, you know, it, it always it does come down to what does your character believe in and why? 
what, uh, you know, is it, I, I, again, I keep on going back to the, my list of things in my closet. You know, you've got religions could give you morality. You've got scripture could give you morality. You've got historical figures, heroes or historical events, um, critical moments in history that then get reflected upon. And then, we, you know, you then have, you know, what, what would X hero have done in this circumstance? What did he, what did he pass down as his wisdom after, you know, um, and you, you know, you know, the equivalent of like a, a Buddha figure or Jesus, a, a historical Jesus Christ figure, you know, who left teaching behind for people to follow. And you can have those things in fantasy novels as well. And you, or, or, or the baseline for all of them is you have simple, long-standing social traditions because you know the 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 wave of people that you know the the Huns, the Goths, etc. They all charged into Europe. Um, they had their own very strong social structure um, and uh, their, their origin stories, their myths, which we don't have a lot of access to because we, we our records of them are post their integration into your, into Roman society. So, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I suppose I could look into it more, but I don't, you, know, you could spend a lifetime exploring those things, but you know, probably, it's, probably. you have, so you always have this um, ability as a writer in fantasy to, uh, if you have an idea about a conflict you want to set up, um, if you want to write a story about um, oppression and uh, the desire to seek freedom, if you want to write a story about the horrible conflict bef between being um, honour bound to uh, uh, be dutiful towards your family and your blood kin and that comes into conflict with your own sense of personal morality with regards to what their actions are or if you are literally in, entangled in two families and which family do you choose these are moral choices that but they're that, that you're you can then stick your characters into those difficult positions where they're forced to make difficult choices and making moral or, or in creating moral codes or these basis of morality is one of the things where you can create sharp differences between characters even characters that are on the same side you know it's it where everyone's on like team alpha and they're like going to go against the bad guys it's it's much sometimes it's much more interesting to have um people with different eth uh, sort of ethical backgrounds so saying, well, I think we should proceed in this way. Oh, I don't like, uh, you know, I would never, I could never uh, lie to my opponent. Um, you know, I, I believe in an open-handed battle, which is, um, or I'm, too, you know, believe in chivalry to the extent that it's self-defeating. Um, my ancestor James the Fourth, or not my ancestor, but James the Fourth of Scotland is quite, quite famous for being a little bit too chivalrous, and uh, it cost him um, in the end his life at Flodden, depending on the historical. Um, uh, uh, treat uh, treatise that you believe, but you know, you, but the, you have the potential always to give people different um, priorities through their origin culture, which shapes their morality. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing is that morality is it works. It works on so many different levels. So you yeah, know, you can you can have like a uh, well, uh, mor morality. Conflicts uh, on nation levels, but also within just uh, two characters or or certain groups within within the nation or within the city who has for some reason different views on things. You know, as as long as you as long as you ground it in something that we understand why there's a difference, right. and, uh, that you can play with morality on uh, so many levels. But uh, but I don't yeah. know, is there any is there any any kind of last good things that we have to know about morality that we have left out so far? I think that um, maybe, uh, I think I've you know, sort of talked in circles a little bit at times, but I think that one of the things that you can look to do to tie things in together is, um, you know, what are the influences on day-to-day -day life? Are the rituals, observances, sayings, proverbs, um, short stories, like the things that people's mothers would drill into them as children, the things that uh, uh, that are regarded as always being social faux pas. You can build them in uh, to, your, to your story in little incremental bites, um, which help to flesh out the culture and the characters um, and helps to inform what they do and why they do. And I think when you're 
trying as a, an author to come up with a, a morality, I think first, have your big idea, have your basis. Is it a good evil? Is it a, a duty versus rebelliousness? Is it family versus outsider? Um, is it um, the state versus the individual? What is what uh, determines the good in the society versus what determines the bad? And then how does that per, you know you can how does that work on a state level, like big level religion, lower level sort of cults, regular observance, and then personal behaviors and what people would regard as right or wrong? Because we all grow up with our mothers saying, "Don't do that, do this, don't do that, do this." And if you can think of it from the bottom up um, as to how people growing up in those societies would be raised and what things would surround them, then you get a very grounded sense of what it is and that your readers, if you can build those little touches in, will also, without you having to lecture, because you don't want to explain, you don't want to have a big info dump saying, this is the morality of my world. You want it, you want it to be built up nicely. So if, if you can have a sense of how uh, people would be raised in that culture, and what they would their what they would observe day to day, what they would say and think, that can be built in to give a very convincing uh, moral background to characters, which can then, as I say, the straight the great strength of it is you then have characters can play against each other, reasons to be enemies, reasons to be friends, reasons to tolerate each other despite differences sometimes, mm -hmm. and all of those things can add a, a great richness and depth to your writing. Yeah, I yeah. Think. Absolutely agree, uh, and and I also you know for 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 you out there watching, I mean there, there is a ton of things to be taken from Roddy have what he has talk, been talking about here, um, and it might at first glance seem a bit complicated. It might seem like oh there's a lot of stuff to think about here, but on the other hand you you, you can really like let morality play into on so many levels, you know. Um, just uh, the kids being brought up by their parents, uh, why are they taught that uh, A is okay and B is not okay? You know, even on that level, we are playing with morality. So, so you can you can scale it up and down as you want. So I, I hope uh, everybody watching here got a lot out of this uh, conversation. But uh, Roddy, if, if people want to know more about you, where, where can they find out, find out about you on the internet? Um, they can find me at uh, rodericktmcdonald.com. Um, R O D E R I C K T M A C D O N A L D uh, dot com. Um, I'm also uh, there's a, a author uh, page on uh, Facebook at uh, Roderick T McDonald on the Facebook. Um, and uh, yeah, I blog every Monday and Thursday, so I still have to write today's blog. Maybe I'll write on morality. Um, and uh, and um, yes, and I've, I've got one book out there. It's uh, called The Thief and the Demon. Um, it's available on Amazon at uh, your local Amazon site, whichever country you happen to be in. Uh, it's available as an ebook and uh, and paperback. And I'm just going to show it on screen because I've never done that before. Yeah. Oh! Um, yeah. So yeah, thumbnail. Hmm. Maybe I need to get a redesign. But it's a <laughs> it's a fantastic book about a thief who gets uh, wrongly uh, it's set up for a murder that he didn't commit, thrown into a prison, um, sentenced to a gruesome execution. And uh, then he for he escapes because no one wants to be gruesomely executed, but in the process of escape, releases a demon and is drawn into a web of intrigue uh, with uh, guided by a lot of very powerful individuals who have reasons to have freed both him and the demon. And many shenanigans ensue as he discovers that not most of them uh, want him dead. Um, so. Yeah, well, he, it's it's the old, how do I get out of this? 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 And uh, eventually, after a lot of uh, running around and not knowing what to do, being a basic headless chicken, our boy, the worm turns and uh, he starts, he shows his stuff by the end of the book. Cool. our hero so yes do it's a fantastic read uh, just uh, check it out the thief and the demon at amazon.com cool oh and i'd Thanks like to say one last thing uh, oh no yeah. i'd like to say one last thing one last thing um just um the uh in the discussion of roman sexual morality i want to make it uh, once again very clear pederasty is wrong and uh, i was mentioned it as a as a historical thing which accepted it is in no way okay today so I just want to make that absolutely clear. 
Um, for the record, and as this is going to go into perpetuity, I want to in no way condone that activity. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool, cool. Thank you. It freaked me out. I was like, should I be saying this? Hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you for watching, um, and I hope you got a lot out of uh, today's video. So all there's left to say is uh, see you next Monday. <laughs>